All right. I need a few volunteers, a couple, a couple volunteers. All right, I'm going to get Emily to come up. Any Emily up here with me? I'm going to get Tamara to come up. And I think I need one grown up. I need a grown up who can come up and be a volunteer. I'm going to pick on Elizabeth. I like that they all came up without asking or trying to find out what exactly I was going to have them do. This is great. I'm excited for this. All right. Well, you are now officially in my gym class. So we've been sitting. We've got some movement going. You're in the gym today, so we're going to do a workout, all right? So why don't we start with five jumping jacks. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. Go one, two, three, four, five. All right, good job. All right, that's good. All right. Got to get our shoulders a little more limber. So let's do five arm circles going forward and then going backwards. All right, so going forward. Going one, two, three, four, five. Be careful, all right? Ready? Now go backwards. One, two, three, four, five. All right, we're going to do a walk-out push-up. Go. Really? <laughs> what, you don't know what walk out? Well, Elizabeth might know. Oh, there, see, Elizabeth did it. Good job, Elizabeth. All right. Well, we should probably slow it down for that, okay? You guys don't know. Okay, here's what a walk out push up is. It's an exercise. So, what I do is I squat. So, I squat with me. So, do a squat. Then I'm going to get on my hands, and I'm going to walk out to the push up, and I do a push up. All right. Walk back, and then I stand up. Good job, guys. You did a walk up push up. Good job. All right, lateral plank. Let's go. I don't want to do that. <laughs> lateral plank. There we go. All right, so yeah, we get our side hold for one, two, three, and then we switch sides. Hold for one, two, three. All right, good job. All right, well, thank you for working out with me today. We're all feeling nice and limber. Go grab a seat. Oh, careful. By the way, that's what we do at day camp. We do exercises like that. So Elizabeth kind of had a cheat because she kind of knew what I was going to be going for. All right. Well, some of those exercises, the minute I said the kids knew exactly what I said jumping jacks, they knew what jumping jacks were. They knew what arm circles were. But what happened when I said a walkout push-up? What happened? We'll pick on, uh, we'll pick on Emily and Tamara. They're like, well, what's that? I have no idea what that is. And I mean, I could have explained, okay, well, you squat, you do a squat, and you walk out in your hands, you do a push up, and you walk back. And, but they have necessarily followed those directions with me just saying them. Maybe, maybe not. It could be hard sometimes. If I said squat, do they know what a squat is? They might, they, she might know, because she's been to camp before. But, <laughs> but you know what? When did they really understand what I wanted? When Elizabeth demonstrated the skill. And at day camp, which is coming up real fast, we demonstrate the skills. We show them what we want the kids to do. Today, in church, we are in 1 Corinthians again. We've come back here. Now, I will admit, if you've been here for the past week, sitting here while Captain Chad's been teaching out of the Bible, we've gone to chapter 3, right, Chad? About chapter 3? Yeah. We're gonna, as you can tell, we kind of majorly jumped. Now, he did warn us at the beginning of this, of this series that we weren't going to spend our time on every single chapter. And that's not to say that those other chapters aren't important. They're very important. In fact, all the stuff between 3 to 8... It's important stuff, but it's, it's pretty heavy stuff. And when I was thinking about what God wanted to say this morning, I didn't want to get bogged down. And so I'm like, because some of it's stuff that young men and women, really that's things you probably want to talk through with your mom or your dad, or maybe even a pastor one-on-one, not in front of, every, not in front of the, the whole church in the morning. But I did want to get to what, what's this point? What's Paul writing towards? You see, you've got to know the church in Corinth, they were a little crazy. When I say a little, I mean a lot. <laughs> They're a pretty crazy group. They had all these things going on. So I do reckon, and this is a letter. Who's ever gotten a paper letter written to them? All right. So when you read a letter, you get a letter from your grandma or your aunt or your uncle or your good friend. Do you read the first paragraph, put it down, and come back tomorrow? Is that how we read letters? No, right? 
What do we do? Do we read half the letter, walk away, and come back three days later? No. What do we do with the letter? Grace. We read all of it. Now, I will admit, it can be really hard for 1 Corinthians to read it in one sitting. It's a long letter. But I do recommend when we read our letters in the Bible, the letters that people write, as much as we can read in one sitting, that's how we should do it. Because then we get to understand what the writer is saying. And by the way, grown-ups, that applies to us too. So, for today, the passages that Jackson read and that I read, they're coming to sort of a transition point in the Bible. And there's two things I think we can learn from those couple of passages. See, Paul's talking about others and those things. And the first thing is, we, the first thing is we set an example by thinking about this. You see, when we did the exercises, how we learned to do them was seeing them happen. We had an example to follow. So, that chapter 8, verses 9 to 13, as he was reading it, when Paul was writing it, he's writing at a time when there were a lot of different gods out there. And do you know what? That's even true today. And part of worshiping these gods was serving food to people, but praying for it to these gods. And asking a different God to bless it. And the hope was that the God, this, this particular, that whatever, whoever, whichever God they were praying to, would bless the server and the server's household. And for many of Jesus' followers then, and now, there's been no worry if somebody, if you go and you go to a restaurant and you see different statues you know are different types of gods. You don't work, I don't go out of a restaurant saying, oh man, they had like a, this statue and I, I can tell that like it had incense and stuff. I'm not going to eat there anymore. I'm okay with it because I'm not too worried about it. Paul even says, hey, it doesn't matter. But you know what? And the reason I do that is, I know they're not real. They can't do anything. But you know what? For others, it is a big deal. Um, I have friends who have started following Jesus and then leaving the faith they had. And they say, you know what? Man, I can't go. I have trouble going home because I know my mom and dad are praying to these other gods. And that's if they'll let me in. Because so, sometimes it, it gets, it gets really, they get really upset when you, when you decide you're going to follow Jesus and not worship other gods. So for them to eat that food would be worshiping that God, and that's a no-go for them. Because what are the first two commandments? Who knows the no first two commandments of the Ten Commandments? Who knows them? I'm going to get a microphone to see who wants to say it out loud. Does anyone remember the first two commandments and the Ten Commandments? Ryan, you got it? Yeah. All right. What are the first two commandments and the Ten Commandments? Honor, honor your mother and father. That's a good one. That's not one of the first ones, though. I shall not steal. That's a good one, too. That's not one of the first two. You should have no other... No other... Uh, gods. No other gods. Yeah. And you should not worship... Do not, do not worship the plain... Idols. Us. Idol statues. Good job, Ryan. So, don't worship other God, or have no other God before God, and don't worship idols. Those are the first two commandments. And they say, you know what? If I go and eat that sandwich that that person made, I know they prayed to their other God, and I can't do that. So here's Paul's solution. I go to I go out to lunch with my buddy and I who they started to follow Jesus and they left that, that faith of their family. And we go and we sit down, we go to a restaurant, and he sees those statues and he goes, you know what, Noel, I, I can't do this. If we do this, I, I feel like I'm worshiping that God. So what does Paul say? Noel, this is what your job is with your buddy. You need to kick him in the butt and say, get over it. Get over it, buddy. You need to toughen up. Get your faith strong, man. Is that what Paul's solution is? Absolutely not. Paul's solution is this. That my buddy matters. He matters to me so much that even though I've been dying for that sandwich, I don't want a sandwich. There's a Paul Catholic joint back in bed. My buddy, 
his faith matters more than my sandwich. So I can say, you know what? Let's go to Tim Hortons. We, I'll, have, I'll, have a, I'll have a chicken wrap. That's cool. And we walk away because he matters more than my sandwich. Bible verse is going to come up on the screen. I'd like somebody to read it out loud. I know and I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no fruit in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. There's one more there. The kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Romans 14:14-19. Thank you very much, Colonel Gwen. All right, we're gonna talk about basketball. Who's a basketball fan? All right, is my is my buddy Wayne here today? Wayne Burt? Oh, no, he's a total basketball guy. Well, there's a guy by the name of, of Corey Weissman, and he was a player for a, a place called Gettysburg College. During his first year of college, he suffered a stroke, and if you know what a stroke is. It, it's, it's, it's something that happens in your brain, and it left him paralyzed on one side of his body. So for four years, he spent his body rehabbing, trying to get himself strong again. And he was finally able to walk, but he had a limp. And he definitely didn't have the coordination to play basketball competitively. But you see, he was loved by his teammates. So the coach brought him in for a game, and he wanted to get him into an actual game in his senior year. So. To start the game, Corey was nominated the captain, and he let out the starting five players for his first and last game. He started the game for a couple of minutes, and then he sat down. And then, towards the end of the game, with a minute to go in Gettysburg, they were in charge. They had, they had a huge lead. He put them back out. Now, if you don't know the rules of basketball, you just, again, basketball, usually by the end of the game, Teams have accumulated fouls, so that if you foul someone, even if they're just kind of walking, they get two free throws. They're playing a Washington team. And the Washington to coach called a timeout. And he brings his team out, they go on the court, and, and there's Corey, and they foul him. And because he was fouled, he gets to take a free throw. So Corey gets up, and he... I'm not sure how he got set for a free throw shot. He gets two of them. He takes his first one, and it, I mean, he's, he's recovering from a stroke, so it, it doesn't go very far. But he gets a second shot, and he lines it up, and he shoots it, and it's a swish. It drops in, and he gets his first, he gets a final free throw, a final basket for his bas uh, college career. The Gettysburg coach said he's never seen another team express such a level of compassion and sportsmanship in a, in a college game. You see, the Washington coach could have said, well, no baby, we'll just run out the clock, game's over. But you see, the Washington coach and the team thought, Corey deserved one more chance to get a fast in the net. They thought about somebody else before themselves. So we talked about being an example. We think of others first. But what are we doing when we think about others first? That's the second thing. That's the second part that I read this morning, which is we set an example so we can share Jesus with other people. You see, Paul, now, what he's saying is, I will do whatever it takes to introduce people to Jesus. Now, what do we know about Paul? Paul was what? What was his family background? Oh, day camp, Sunday school people who come here. He was, was he a Gentile or was he Jewish? Jewish. Jewish. So there are rules he was supposed to follow. 
He was only supposed to eat certain kinds of food and not eat other kinds of food. Hint, he was not having a bacon cheeseburger. That's a good Jewish boy. Not that they had bacon cheeseburgers in those days, but if they did, he wouldn't have them. And there were special days set aside for worshiping God. Now you're like, well, we all have all these. Yeah, but the people around the Jewish people are like, you guys are, you guys are lazy taking that day off. You could be working. But they said, no, these are special days set aside for worshiping God. But Paul had a special call to tell non-Jewish people about Jesus. And he didn't want anything to stop that from happening. So you know what? If he was with his Jewish friends that he wanted to share Jesus with, he followed those rules because they meant more than getting a chance to do whatever he wanted. And if it was with his, Jew- his non-Jewish friends he wanted to share Jesus with, if that man having a bacon cheeseburger, he would suffer for Jesus gladly eating a bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> for me, that would not be so much suffering. That would be a wonderful mission. Yeah. But he thought about other people. I'm going to put up another Bible verse I'd like someone to read out loud. Thank you very much, much, Jackson. But something else Paul wrote. It says, you guys have freedom. And yeah, you can do whatever you want to make yourselves happy, but that's not what it's for. It's to tell others about Jesus. It's to serve other people. You know what the cool... I love it. Who likes history here? Okay, I can see people who don't because that's what teaches it. If you get someone who talks modern like this and let's say it's like 1860 and this event happened and then it was followed by this event in 1861, I can get why you do more. I do more. But you know what history really is? It's stories. And we learn so much when we hear the stories of history. Many historians, when we talk about the church, the church exploded after Jesus left and gave the Holy Spirit. And part of why that happened was how the Christians behaved. They were generous with each other, but not just other Christians, but non-Christians. Now you better understand, well, I thought, is that really a big deal? You know what, in, in Jesus' time, in the first two years, being kind and merciful was not a good thing, it was a bad thing. We people gave mercy. If something bad happened to you, it's because that God said you were, that you deserve something bad to happen to you. Mercy was weakness. But Christians weren't like that. They gave grace, love, mercy, and kindness to people who had done nothing, to the people who had mocked them and made fun of them and maybe even hurt them. Christian communities were places where people lived longer and healthier. And when people got sick or were poor or something bad had happened, it was the Christians who provided for their needs. And as Christians extended those, that mercy, not just to other Christians, but to their neighbors. In fact, at one point, I think it's in the third century, there was a horrible sickness that went through the town and people ran for the hills. And all, all the priests and all these other faith gods, they ran away. People went to the temples looking for the priests to ask the gods, say, call the gods to save us, and they were gone. They left. They wanted no part of this. But who stayed behind? Who cared for the sick? The Christian. Jesus did it through the Christians. The Christians stayed and took care of the sick. Because they believed what Paul had said. That they were to love their neighbors as they love themselves. And because of that, it changed the Roman Empire radically. And it changed the world as we know it today. So guys and girls, men and women, whether you're three or 103, we still have a mission to do. We still have a chance to be examples to the people around us. But what kind of example are we going to be? Are we going to be examples of me first? Nah. Is that the example God wants of us? No, absolutely not. We think of others. Now, we do that because we care about them. But what do we really want to share with them at the end of all that? That we're just, we're just really 
nice people. Is that what I'm? Is that what I want? The only thing for them to know. No. No. Well, who, who do I want them to know? I want them to know about Jesus. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come back, and we're going to sing a song. You see, the reason that we can do this is not because we know Jesus is some sort of idea out there in history, and I read some good books on him, and, you know, I know a lot about Jesus. I could pass a Bible college quiz tomorrow. That's not why I can be an example. I can be an example because Jesus, I know Jesus, and Jesus lives in me through the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I want to do is make sure that before we go downstairs and enjoy lunch together, a chance to hang out and talk and encourage each other, I don't want you to leave here without a chance to talk to God and say, you know what, if you've never followed Jesus, maybe you've been coming to church for a long time, you're like, you know what, I don't know if I've ever said I want to follow Jesus. And you want to do that this morning? We got these benches up here. It's called the mercy seat. Another church is going to call the altar. It's a place you can come and pray and talk with God. If you want someone to come and pray with you, that will happen. If you don't want that, that's okay. No one asks you. We have this thing, the holiness table. If you want to come stand at the holiness table and pray and talk about all that stuff, you can do that. You can also do that sitting where you are. That's the great thing about God. He's everywhere. You don't have to be here. But sometimes we need to do those things that helps our minds and our bodies understand that. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time and you're like, you know what? I don't know if I've been a great example lately. Maybe I have been thinking about myself a little bit more than I should. You want to come and pray for that. And maybe you've been doing great. And all you want to do is come and say, you know what, God, thank you that you've changed my life so much that I don't think about myself so much anymore. Help me to think about others even more than I have. Than, than I have. But the one thing I do ask is you don't leave here without talking to God. So we're going to sing a song, Be the Center. And it's a prayer. It's a prayer asking Jesus to come be the center of our lives. Because as He's the center of our lives, He changes us so that we can think of others first. And as we think of others, then we can serve them and tell them about the difference He makes in us. So I invite you to sing with us as we sing Jesus Be the Center.